Paul refers to himself as the chief sinner. And he says that Jesus saved him as a pattern to show the world that if I will save the chief sinner, then I will save you, right? Well, what do we know about Paul? What do we know? Why does Paul refer to himself as the chief sinner? He persecuted the church. You see how that's helpful? To kind of get some, 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 some perspective into what Paul is saying to Timothy. Paul is saying, look, I got it. You want to talk about dirt in your past. You want to talk about dirt under your fingernails. I persecuted the church. I led Christians to arrest and prison and death. Right? And Jesus himself saved me. Now, how does that play into your study? Well, when you start to read that passage and you start to reflect that this is the man that persecuted the church and you start to reflect on how marvelous the salvation of the Lord is that he would save Paul, you may go back to Acts chapter 9 and be looking and say, he asked Paul, why are you persecuting me? You see how that maybe opens a door in your mind? So I always ask, ask, who wrote a report of the event? Were they an eyewitness, right? Were they, were they a participant? Was the miracle worked on them or, or what have you? Who was involved as a witness to the action? What are the themes or the intent of the book? This is where you need a good study Bible. When you get a good study Bible, a lot of times right at the beginning of the book, there'll be a page where they tell you about the book and they'll tell you what the themes are, right? So when, when John, for example, when we say his themes are light versus darkness, and, and that kind of is an example of belief versus unbelief, well, when we read a passage like we find in, in John chapter 12, right around verse 40, right around verse 35, long in there, John says something along these lines. He says, but although many... Although Jesus worked many miracles, he could, he could do no more because they didn't believe him, nor would they receive him, right? And so what, what John is saying is he's talking about the darkness involved with rejecting Christ. And Christ couldn't do anything because the people would not or did not receive him, right? In some cases, they couldn't receive him, right? Because of the condition of their hearts, etc. Does that make sense? All right. What is the context? And we talked about that. There's an internal context. There's, there's where it appears in a book, because Mark in particular doesn't tell things in chronological order, right? There is an experiential context. A lot of these narratives, you know, the people in the narratives have been through some things, mm -hmm. amen? amen? We've been through some things. So when Jesus communicates his truth to us, it's in the context of our own experience. Does that make sense? Amen. So, so how do the disciples respond, and how should they respond, based on what they've been through? Right? It's a question for all of us to ask. When this storm runs up, comes up in our life, how do we respond? Do we respond as people who have been with Jesus? People for, for whom Jesus has already performed miracles. Amen? So what is the historical context? How does it fall in the history of, of Israel? Or how does it fall in the history of Palestine? How does it fall in our personal history? Or in the personal history of the person in the passage? Make sense? What is to be learned? Here are your, here are your important, really important questions for Bible study. Anytime you sit down and, and study the Bible, here's your, here's your major questions. All right? One... What is to be learned about Christ in this moment, in this passage? What is there to be learned, and what is the application for my life? Lord, think about it this way. The Lord, this is my ragged Bible, 66 books. 66 books, and the Lord of glory, who knows the end from the beginning, who before the foundation of the world was even laid, had a plan, has summarized that plan in 66 books. And not only has he summarized his plan in these 66 books, but he has given you every answer you need for every situation 
in your life or in the life of anybody you become aware of in these 66 books. It is that concise. Does that make sense? Amen? Amen. All right. So therefore, it's there for a reason. The Holy Spirit preserved it for us for our reading today, even though it's thousands of years old. Right? And he had to have done it for a purpose. He had to have done it so that we could get something out of it to apply to our lives. So we have to ask the Lord as we pray, Lord, why is it here? What does it say to me? Sometimes I can just identify with the character of the Bible. Sometimes I'm, look, I'm reading a passage and I'm reading Psalm 51 and, and David says, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. And as I read that, and I understand what David did and why he was brought to that place, but you know what? I suffered from road rage today. And what, you know, if, if the Lord says that what comes out is really a reflection of what's in within. Then today, if I yelled, you idiot, at the, at the driver that cut me off in traffic, well, maybe my heart is not as clean as it could be. So when I sit there and I say, Lord, created me a clean heart, I, don't, I understand that the Lord wants it spotless. You know, it's not enough to be clean or dirty by degree. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's not enough to say, well, Lord, I didn't take anybody's wife. I didn't set them up to be killed, right? I don't have a baby on the way, mm -hmm. so therefore I'm clean. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, be ye perfect. So when I read, created me a clean heart, that's my prayer every day, right? When I, when I turn to, to the last chapter in the book of Revelation, and the writer says, basically, let those that are doing dirt go and do dirt. If you're a dog, go and be a dog. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Mm. I ask the Lord every day, Lord, when you come back today, please. Mm. Thus far, the answer has been no. But one day, you might surprise me. <laughs> right? <laughs> but but, but, but when, I, when I read that, the encouragement is, it doesn't matter how wicked the Lord is. It doesn't matter how treacherous people. Are. It doesn't matter how shady, right, some of my own family might be. Even so, Lord, you're still coming. Even so, when you do come, you promise you're going to wipe away every tear. Mm. You're going to make mm. it all better, right? You're going you're gonna to make this irrelevant in the, in the big scheme of things. Mm. And I'm going to be with you forever. Mm. You, you understand what I'm saying? Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I need that one. Okay, here's our biblical context, as I, as I alluded to earlier. This miracle of walking on the water is preceded by Jesus' rejection at Nazareth. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles. Uh, tell you what, let's go, to, let's go to Mark's Gospel first. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. And if I could just get somebody to read... Verses 1 through 6. And he went out from there, and he came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? I'm sorry, what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this a carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Job, and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took defense of him. And Jesus said to them, The prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives his own household, but he could do no, more, no miracle there except that he had laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he wondered at their unbelief, and he was going about the village, 
going around the village to teach it. Amen. Here's what's interesting. Jesus goes home, right? In Mark's gospel, he goes home after he stilled the storm on the sea, after he stilled the storm on the shore with the, with the demoniac. He then leaves the Decapolis, which is those ten cities, that region where he was. He leaves that region and he goes to Galilee. Okay? He goes... And, and, and when he gets there, the crowds are thronging him because they, they've heard tell of this wonderful miracle work, right? And he has the encounter that you're familiar with, with, with Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, who runs up to him and says, my daughter's at home, sick unto death. Can you come to my house and heal her? Before he can leave the scene, he agrees to go. Before he can leave the scene, uh, the woman with the issue of blood touches him and kind of delays the trip. By the time they get to Jairus' house, the girl has passed. Jesus says she's only sleeping. So, so let it, I'm sorry, before they even leave, uh, they get word from Jairus' house that the daughter has passed away. Jesus says, let's just go. She's sleeping. So Jesus gets to the house. The mourners are there. He puts everybody out except for a couple of his disciples, and he raises the girl from the dead. Surely news of this has gone out everywhere, okay? And Jesus then goes to his hometown. He goes to Nazareth. He goes to goes home. And they can't get past what they think they know about Jesus. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the, the son of Mary? One of the gospel writers says. So they were even disrespecting Jesus because of the, the rumors that maybe were out there about who his daddy really was. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, it was unusual for a Jew to be referred to as the son of a woman. Right? You were going to be the son of a man. So, but we don't know who his daddy is. So they are really dis really disrespecting him. Okay? Jesus can't work any miracles. The Bible says why? Because of their what? Disbelief. Because of their unbelief. So let me pause here and, and just point out that Jesus has the same issue with humans today. It's not, it's, it's like we said, a sow, you know, we talked about the parable. A sower goes out to sow, right, and the seed, some lands by the wayside, some lands on thorny soil, some lands on rocky soil. Some lands on good, good soil, right? There's nothing wrong with the sower. The sower went out to sow. There's nothing wrong with the sower. There's nothing wrong with the seed. It's the soil. It's the heart. And so what we see at Nazareth is we have some heart problems. We have, we have the inability. What we have here is a failure to believe. We don't have a failure to communicate. We have a failure to believe. We have a failure to open your heart so that you can receive the truth. Okay? And it had to be incredibly frustrating to Jesus because this is home. Right? So he says a prophet's not without honor except in his own country, and so he leaves, and the Bible says he couldn't really do any miracles, any works, other than healing a few sick people. Which is stunning, and I think which illuminates the problem. Because don't you think everywhere else Jesus went, when, he, when they talk about how Jesus healed multitudes, that somebody would see somebody get healed, they'd be like, heal me too. Mm -hmm. Right? But in Nazareth, they didn't even, some of them, I guess most of them, didn't even want to accept the healing. I know you didn't do it. How could you possibly do it? 